All right, today we're gonna to talk about one of the most important terms in venture capital, and that is the liquidation preference. Now, liquidation preferences are super important to venture capitalists, but they're also an area of real heartburn for entrepreneurs. And when used appropriately, they can be a great tool in the tool bag of venture capitalists, but if used inappropriately, they can also lead to damaged reputations and hard feelings. So let's dive in and really understand what a liquidation preference is and the different types that exist, why it's important, and what you should be aware of whether you're an entrepreneur or an investor when you're evaluating the liquidation preferences being offered in an investment. All right, so first of all, we gotta have a basic understanding of a liquidation preference. Now, liquidation preferences are tied to preferred shares. Part of the reason why venture capitalists invest with preferred shares is because it gives them the ability to tie certain rights and privileges to those shares one of them being this idea of a liquidation preference. Now, liquidation preference is all about protecting the downside, or at least that is what it should be. There are two types of liquidation preference. You have a participating and you have a non-participating. With a non-participating liquidation preference, this is how it works. Let's say that your company is valued by venture capitalists at $9 million and the VCs invest $1 million. So you have a $9 million pre-money and a $1 million investment from venture capitalists. In this case, let's assume that the venture capitalists ask for a 1x, actually, how do I do that? This then results in a $10 million post money valuation. And this is important because this is the value of your business going forward, right? It was worth $9 million before the investors came in. Then they gave you a million dollars. Hopefully you didn't just take that million dollars and light it on fire, but rather added it to the company. And so it still retains that million dollars of value. So now your post money is $10 million. Okay, let's assume that the investors in this case asked for a 1x liquidation preference, uh, non-participating. What that means is that in the event of a liquidation where the company gets acquired, the investors will have the right to receive their money back that they invested first before the common gets anything. Now, usually there's also a clause in here that says that they have to choose. And this is especially the case for non-participating they have to choose whether or not they want their original investment back or they have to choose if they want to convert their preferred shares into common and participate in the upside. So let's walk through an example. Let's assume that the company gets an offer to be acquired for $50 million. The VC has to choose. Does he or she want their million dollars back, which would only represent 2% of the overall transaction, or would they rather have their ownership percentage, which is actually 10% of the transaction? In that case, that would be $5 million. Well, under the terms of liquidation preference, what it, what it effectively says is they have to choose between these two. If they wanna retain their preferred share status, then they would only get the million dollars back. If, on the other hand, they're willing to convert to common, then they were to receive this $5 million. So you can guess what a smart VC is going to choose. They're going to convert their shares into common and they're gonna participate in this upside. Things don't go super well and the company does find a buyer, but that buyer is only willing to pay them $5 million. Well, in that case, the company, that valuation is a lot lower than our $10 million post money. So everybody is gonna lose money theoretically on this deal. Let's do the same math in this case, Let's break it out between preferred shares and common. So preferred shares, so under the preferred shares, they invested $1 million. And they have this liquidation preference that says, regardless, we get paid our million dollars first. On common, if they were to convert to common, they would maintain their 10% ownership. And 10% of 5 million is going to be 500,000. So you can probably guess again what which one of these two an investor is going to pick. They're going to pick 
maintaining their ownership as a, as a preferred shareholder and get back their original investment. Now, this is not the outcome that VCs are looking for. They don't wanna just get their money back. What they really want is a much better outcome like our $5 million outcome. But if the choice is getting back only 500K or getting back a million, I'm sure you can, you can guess which one they're going to choose. So now let's go talk, let's talk about participating preferred. So under participating, it's like you get your cake and you get to eat it too. That's the way I like to think about it. So same scenario, I get a $9 million valuation on my pre-money. I raise a million dollars. for 10% of the company. And that leaves me with a $10 million post money valuation. Let's, let's run through the math here. So in this case, venture capitalists don't have to choose between maintaining their, their ownership as preferred shares or common shares. Under participating, they're able to get both. So let's assume that we have a $50 million exit. In that case, the investors are gonna get their, five, their $1 million back, $49 million left. But remember, they still own 10% and they get to participate on the upside of that too. So once they get their million dollars back, they basically convert to common and they get 10% of that, so they get another $4.9 million. So their total return then is 5.9 million. And the remaining investment, and the common shares then split 44.1 million. Okay, so you can see how this resulted in a better outcome of 59, sorry, you can see how this resulted in a better outcome of $5.9 million compared to the $5 million of our non participating. What happens though if instead of selling for $50 million, I sell for $5 million? And this is where participating provides even more downside protection for investors, but also hurts our common shareholders even more. So in this case, again, as an investor, I'm gonna get my million dollars back right off the bat. That leaves $4 million for common shareholders. And then I'm gonna get 10% of that. So that's another 400K that comes out, giving the investor $1.4 million and leaving 3.6 million for common. So in that case, this company sold at a valuation that was half what it was when the investor invested, and yet they made $400,000 in profit. So you can see how this would be really powerful if you're a venture capitalist and why you would wanna push for participating preferred. And oftentimes the argument is, well, hey, look, if you, if you send this thing to the moon, let's say you sell the company for $500 million, right? Which is a great outcome for everybody. What's like, you know, you're gonna give me a million bucks? and then you're gonna have 499 left to split, you know? And I, like that million bucks, it's just like, it's just such a small rounding error in the overall equation. It's not that big a deal, don't worry about it. Um, but in reality, what it allows these investors to do is actually make money even on less than ideal outcomes for the startups. The common shareholders are typically the founders, the employees, the ones that are putting in the, the work day after day with their, their blood, sweat, and tears. And it can be really demoralizing to work so hard and then sell the company and have the investor take every single last penny of the returns. You could easily see a scenario where the investor invested not a million dollars, but $5 million and ended up taking all of the exit value such that the common shareholders got nothing. This used to happen a lot more commonly than it does today and resulted in really bad reputations for a lot of different funds. And that reputation, and over time, what happened is as power started to shift more towards entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs decided, you know what? They talked to each other and they said, we don't want to work with those types of firms that do that. And so what's happened is over time, there's been a shift from really aggressive terms like participating to non-participating preferred terms because they're more entrepreneur friendly. And here's the other thing, if you're a venture capitalist, why you might have a strong preference toward non-participating. The reason for that is because if you have participating liquidation preferences as a clause in, in your deals, 
guess who else is gonna want it? Every subsequent investor after you is also going to wanna have participating preferred clauses. And those clauses ultimately are going to hurt you as an early stage investor. And so in my opinion, it's best to start with what we call a clean term sheet in the industry. A simple 1x liquidation preference that is non-participating. Now, I just wanna note that there is no governing law that says it has to be 1x. And if a company is in a really tough position and they need to raise money, it's not uncommon or unreasonable for a venture investor to say, hey, I will invest this money, but I need some additional downside protection. And maybe they need you know, a 2x liquidation preference or maybe a 3x liquidation preference, or maybe they wanna have a participating preferred liquidation preference because it gives them the ability to make some money even if things don't play out the way that everybody hopes it will. The other thing sometimes that you'll see is caps on the amount of participation. So it'll they'll be able to participate up to three times and then they have to choose whether or not they convert to common. So there are a lot of ways to kind of play around with this to get both the entrepreneur and the investor happy or at least not overly grumpy. But hopefully that, that's a helpful explanation of what liquidation preferences are, what they aren't, and how they can be used as a tool in negotiating a deal between a venture capitalist and an entrepreneur. If you enjoyed that video, check out my other one where we talk about the difference between hedge funds and private equity funds.